Olá, boa noite. Com transmissão pela TV Cultura, emissoras afiliadas e conectado no YouTube, Facebook e Twitter, o Roda Viva começa agora. Um dos escritores mais lidos do mundo. Ele alcançou a marca de 20 milhões de cópias só no Brasil. Foram um milhão de livros vendidos. PHD em História, o homem que ocupa o centro do Roda Viva de hoje, visitou em suas obras o passado, o presente e o futuro da humanidade. Três de seus livros tentam explicar como o ser humano deixou de ser uma espécie com um impacto semelhante ao de uma água viva para se tornar o animal que domina a Terra. Mas não é só. Agora, ele estabelece uma série de hipóteses pouco animadoras do que virá depois disso. No centro do Roda Viva desta noite, uma das mentes mais celebradas da atualidade, o professor Yuval Noah Harari. Professor de História da Universidade Hebraica de Jerusalém, completou o doutorado pela Universidade de Oxford, no Reino Unido. Autor de Sapiens, Uma Breve História da Humanidade e 21 lições para o século XXI, entre outros livros, em suas palestras ao redor do mundo, responde a questões como a justiça no mundo atual, a história se divide entre mocinhos e bandidos, a maioria das pessoas sabe menos do que pensa que sabe. Para conversar com o Yuval Noah Harari, nós convidamos Célia Rosenblum, ela é editora de projetos especiais do jornal Valor Econômico. Raul Justi Loures, ele é editor-chefe da revista Veja São Paulo. Paulo Saldiva, ele é médico patologista e diretor de, de, do Instituto de Estudos Avançados da USP. Cláudia Costinha, ela é diretora do Centro de Excelência e Inovação em Políticas Educacionais da Fundação Getúlio Vargas e colunista da Folha de São Paulo. Fernanda Diamante, ela é curadora da Flip e editora de ciência da revista 451. Todos nós contamos aqui ainda com o reforço, o olhar atentíssimo do nosso cartunista Paulo Caruso. Professor, boa noite, bem-vindo ao Roda Viva, é um prazer recebê-lo aqui no nosso programa. Professor, o senhor tem falado muito sobre proteção de dados. É, o Brasil viveu uma eleição recentemente e hoje boa parte das discussões no país são pautadas pelas redes sociais ou são influenciadas pelas redes sociais. A rejeição à imprensa e a narrativas baseadas em dados científicos virou uma marca da nossa fase. Qual é o futuro da desinformação nas redes? Uh, that's a big question. Nobody, nobody really knows. Uh, the future of data is maybe one of the most important political questions today in the world, because data is becoming the most important asset in the world. In ancient times, the most important asset was land, and politics was a struggle to control the land. And if too much of the land was concentrated in the hands of a, one person or a few persons, you got a dictatorship. Then in the last two centuries, machines and factories replaced land as the most important asset. Politics became the struggle to control the machines. And dictatorship happened when most of the machines and factories were concentrated in the hands of the government or of a small aristocracy. And now data is replacing machines as the most important asset, and politics becomes a struggle to control the data. Uh, dictatorship now means the concentration or control of too much of the data flow by the government or by a few corporations, and we need to prevent that. We need to regulate the ownership of data, uh, but we still don't know how to do it. We have thousands of years of experience regulating the ownership of land, and we have centuries of experience regulating the ownership of machines, but we don't really have experience in how to regulate the ownership of data, which is why I can't and nobody can predict what the, the, the data market would look like in 20 or 30 years. Uh, eu... Pra, antes de passar a palavra para os colegas, queria só fazer mais uma perguntinha. Qual é a responsabilidade que o senhor atribui às grandes empresas de tecnologia na disseminação de desinformação que está aí mexendo com a política, não só do Brasil, mas de diversos países, hum. Estados Unidos, enfim? Qual é a responsabilidade que elas têm? They have a huge responsibility. Uh, they are the experts. They should know better than anybody else what are the potential dangers of the technologies they are developing, and they should be responsible. 
they should think not just about their profits and about their business model, but also about what they are doing to human society and the political system. But ultimately, it's not the responsibility of these corporations to regulate the technology. It's the responsibility of the political system and of the citizens, because these corporations, ultimately, they don't represent anybody. We didn't vote for them. They are not elected officials. So yes, they should act responsibly, that, that's for sure. But the ultimate responsibility is with the government and with the public uh, who votes for the government. The problem here is that many people, including many politicians, don't understand the new technologies well enough, don't understand the potential for the future. Um, and I would like to emphasize that really we haven't seen anything yet. All the recent scandals, like the Cambridge Analytical scandal in the United States and all these scandals, they are just the tip of the iceberg. The kind of technologies we are going to see in the next decade or two has potential to revolutionize society, the economic system and the political system much more than that. So we need to educate the political system and the citizens about the potential. Perfeito. Fernanda Diamante, por favor. É, obrigada pela presença, um prazer estar aqui, é uma alegria. Eu queria um, citar uma frase do seu livro 21 lições para o século 21, que parece contraditória a princípio, eu queria que você falasse um pouco dela, que é, vou, vou falar em português, é, quanto maior é a potência da ciência, maior é a impotência da razão. É, eu queria entender, quer dizer, o desenvolvimento da ciência faz com que o homem é, não tenha mais controle sobre a, a realidade? Uhum. Queria que você falasse um pouco sobre isso. Yes, I mean, new scientific discoveries and inventions are giving us immense power, but we don't necessarily have the understanding and the responsibility to use this power wisely. So uh, we've seen it before, like with nuclear energy, that the scientists gave humans the power to either create very cheap energy or also to destroy the world with nuclear bombs. And most people, at least at first, did not really understand the technology and therefore lacked the ability to make reasonable decisions. And we are now seeing it again in an even more extreme form. Most people around the world, including most politicians, their understanding of artificial intelligence and biotechnology is very, very limited. Now, these two technologies in particular, artificial intelligence, and biotechnology, bioengineering, they are really giving us divine powers of creation. They are really upgrading humans to be gods. And I don't mean this as a metaphor, but literally, we are acquiring abilities which traditionally were thought to be divine abilities. The ability to re-engineer and to create life. But the vast majority of people and politicians, they have a very limited understanding of the technology and its potential. And therefore, uh, the danger is that we will not make wise decisions about how to, how to use these technologies. Raul? Professor Harari, é, esse clima da tecnologia de enfrentamento político, agora nos Estados Unidos, a candidata Elizabeth Warren e o Facebook do Mark Zuckerberg, uh -huh. claramente estão demonstrando essa falta de confiança entre os dois lados. O senhor vê a possibilidade de a União Europeia ou o governo americano agirem como Theodore Roosevelt há um século contra a Standard Oil? A possibilidade aí de algum governo exigir a quebra desses oligopólios, a fragmentação dessas empresas que têm tanto poder? Potentially, yes. Uh, it depends on two things. First of all, it's uh, on the political will and ability to do it. But there is something more difficult with breaking the monopoly of the giant data companies and information technology companies. If you're talking about, let's say, car manufacturing, and you have, say, one company controlling the whole market of car manufacturing, 
technically, it's not so difficult to split this one giant monopoly into, say, five companies, each controlling 20% of the car manufacturing market. It's, it's difficult politically, but technically, it's, it's, it's easy. With information technology, it's not like that, because the nature of information technology actually encourages a monopoly. If you think about social media, for example, like Facebook, then um, everybody wants to be where everybody else is. The big advantage of Facebook uh, compared to its potential competitors is not necessarily that it has the best technology or the best services. The big advantage is that all, everybody else is already there. So I also want to be there. If you have a social uh, media system with one billion people, and you have another social media system with just 10 million people, everybody would like to be with the one billion. Now, if you take Facebook and split it in two, then again, you'll, it will be a very uh, unstable situation because if you have, say, five social media companies, each with 20% of the market, and then one gets a slight advantage, then again, everybody will move there because I want to be with all my friends in the same place. I don't want to be with just 20% of, of my friends in one social network, and then the rest of the friends, they are on a different network. So built into the technology, there is this tendency to monopoly. And it's the same way as um, like data mining. So the more data is concentrated in, concentrated in one place, the better your statistics the better your predictions. So again, there is this tendency towards monopoly. Think, for example, about, I don't know, uh, medical records. Let's say you have one big company which accumulates more and more medical records about everybody. Then it can make better and better predictions about my medical situation and what drugs I should take or what treatments I should take. Now, if you break this company into 10 small companies, each with just 10% uh, of the market, their predictions, their analysis will be worse than if, you, if, if, all the, if all the data is in the hands of just one big giant company. And if you think about it from a global perspective, you have an even bigger problem. Let's say in the US or the European market, uh, you break the medical market of, of data into a lot of small companies. But in China, you have just one big company which uh, controls that access to the medical records and say DNA of all one billion Chinese. Now, if you have a company which has access to a billion, to the records of a billion people, and its competitor in the US has access only to 50 million people, then obviously the one billion people company will have far better data and statistics. And then if I want to have information about my own medical situation, I would obviously go to the Chinese and not to these small European or American companies. And the only result will be that the Chinese will take over not just China, but all the world. So there are ways to deal with that, but it's difficult. When we're talking about breaking monopoly in the data market, we should always remember that it's much more tricky than breaking monopolies in car manufacturing or oil or anything else because the nature of data technology often encourages monopoly of data. Claudia Costin. Uh, olá, professor Harari. Um prazer em interagir com o senhor. A minha pergunta é a seguinte, como o senhor fala muito nos seus livros do advento da inteligência artificial e da automação acelerada, que vai extinguir muitos postos de trabalho, eventualmente aumentar a desigualdade, porque novos postos serão criados, mas não para as mesmas competências. Nesse sentido, eu queria lhe perguntar que uh, sugestões o senhor traria para a educação das novas gerações para poderem conviver com esse novo mundo? Hmm. Well, the, the basic 
insight or assumption when we approach the question of education is that for the first time in history, we have no idea what the job market would look like in 30 years and what skills people will need. Throughout history, it was always difficult to predict the future, of course, what will happen in, in politics and, and so forth. But with regard to the basic skills people will need, change was much more slow. So you knew what to teach the, the, the next generation. But now we have no idea what skills people will need in 2040 or 2050. The only thing we are certain about is that they will need to keep learning and keep reinventing themselves throughout their lives. It's not that you learn a profession in your 20s and then you work in that profession for your whole life. No, you will have to change again and again. So the most important thing is um, how to teach people flexibility, how to teach people to keep learning and keep changing throughout their lives. And this is extremely important and extremely difficult because change is stressful. And especially beyond a certain age, people don't like to keep changing again and again. But in the 21st century, it will be a necessity. So this is one key insight that we don't, you shouldn't focus on a particular skill, like, okay, let's teach people how to code computers, or let's teach people Chinese. No, we need to teach people how to be mentally flexible. The other key issue is that we need to think globally again, because there's going to be a huge difference between different countries. Because of the changes in the job market, people will need to keep learning throughout their lives. The big issue will not be the disappearance of jobs. There will be new jobs. The big issue is retraining. Now, rich countries will have the resources to retrain their workforce. But poor countries may, may lack these resources. And the consequence might be that the automation revolution will benefit the rich countries, which are already rich, while completely ruining the poorer countries. In the 20th century, the big advantage of poor countries was cheap labor. The ticket to how to advance your economy if you're a poor country, unless you have lots of oil or something, mm -hmm. is cheap labor. But cheap labor will not be so important in the 21st century, because this is the easiest things to replace. And then the question is, so what will the poor countries do? If we don't build a global safety net, what we will see is the automation revolution creating immense wealth in some countries, like China and the USA, which are leading the automation revolution, and completely ruining the economies of developing countries which cannot retrain their workforce fast enough and don't benefit from the AI revolution. Célia. Boa noite, professor. Eu gostaria de saber assim, nesse contexto, quando tem essa necessidade de criação de uma rede de segurança global, como é que se constrói esse tipo de rede quando você tem populismo crescente, guerra comercial é, e nacionalismo cada vez mais exacerbado? Como o senhor acha que é possível fazer isso? It's impossible. <laughs> if we see a, an acceleration of uh, the trade, trade war and isolationism and extreme nationalism, mm. there won't be any safety net. And some countries will benefit greatly and other countries might completely collapse. But then the collapse of the weaker countries will destabilize the entire world. Over the last four or five years, we have seen the world running in the wrong direction. Exactly when we need greater global cooperation, what we are seeing is greater tensions and some of the most powerful countries in the world, which should be responsible, take responsibility, they are actually the ones, like the United States, which are destabilizing the global system. Um, I don't think that the problem is nationalism. I think the problem is a misunderstanding of nationalism. Um, in itself, nationalism is a wonderful thing. What we need to remember 
is that nationalism is not about hating foreigners. Nationalism is about loving your compatriots. And therefore, there is no contradiction between nationalism and globalism. In the 21st century, in order to um, really protect the safety and prosperity of your compatriots, of the people in your nation, you have to cooperate with foreigners, both in the economic field, also with regard to climate change, also with regard to dangerous technologies from nuclear weapons to killer robots. We need, if you're a good nationalist in the 21st century, you have to be a globalist. Because the only way you can protect the people in your country is by cooperating with people in other countries. Unfortunately, there is this misunderstanding that some politicians also spread that nationalism is about hating foreigners and hating minorities. So to prove that I'm a big nationalist, I would spread hatred against others. And we need to correct this mistake. If you're a good nationalist, show this by taking care of your compatriots, for example, by paying your taxes and not taking bribes. This is a good nationalist. It has nothing to do with hating people. Dr. Paulo. Dr. Lari, it's a pleasure to talk with you. When in Illuminism, Descartes imaginava que a ciência iria salvar a humanidade. É, ele pensava a ciência como um common, e hoje ela é uma commodity, é, tanto do ponto de vista do acesso, né, como médico, por exemplo, a gente tem que decidir se, eu vou, se nós vamos cuidar de quem precisa ou de quem mais pode contribuir, justamente porque as grandes corporações vão visar o lucro. E assim com a informação. Um caçador-coletor, o Facebook era uma fogueira onde se reuniam as pessoas no entorno e agora você usa essa informação como uma commodity. O senhor fala de princípios de criação de mecanismos de proteção global. É, o senhor acha isso possível? Eu queria uma questão, uma, uma declaração assim. É, o senhor não terá meios objetivos de responder, mas... O senhor acredita que nós, seres humanos, da forma como nós estamos cada um voltados para si mesmo, teremos essa, é, esse movimento? It's, it's possible, but very difficult and not, not inevitable. I don't know what the chances are. But humans today cooperate globally far better than in any previous time in history. You look at the global trade network, so you've seen nothing like that previously in history. You see the way that humans, we have nuclear weapons for 70 years now, and we have managed to avoid so far a nuclear war, and actually the last 70 years, partly because of the threat of nuclear weapons, have been the most peaceful era in human history. Now, still wars, I come from Israel, I know this perfectly well, but compared to any previous time in history, we are still in the most peaceful era. Today in the world, and you probably also know it from your own work, uh, sugar is now more dangerous than gunpowder. Many more people die from diabetes and from uh, overeating and things like that than they die from human violence. That's an amazing achievement. And to give maybe one more example, if you think about, the, say, the uh, Football World Cup, that's an amazing display of global cooperation. I mean, the World Cup is a competition between nations, and people have fierce loyalty to their national team, but you can't have a World Cup unless everybody first agree on the same rules for the game. Now, a thousand years ago, it would have been utterly impossible to have a World Cup in any kind of sport not just because different parts of the world had no communication between them, but even if they communicated, they couldn't agree on the same rules. So a thousand years ago or 500 years ago, you didn't have a World Cup or an Olympic game. Now, at least in some areas, uh, you know, the Brazilians and the French and the Japanese and the Russians, they can at least agree on the rules for football, which is a, quite an achievement. So agreeing on rules for how to uh, manage 
artificial intelligence is going to be much more difficult than agreeing on rules for football. Uh, and I don't know if we succeed. Maybe we fail. And the, the results will be catastrophic for billions of people. But I think there is a chance. There is hope. Thank you. O Roda Viva vai fazer uma pausa rapidíssima, só para a gente tomar um ar aqui, um fôlego. A discussão está super rica. Não sai daí, fica com a gente. É um segundinho só. A gente já volta. Roda Viva está de volta com o escritor Yuval Noah Harari. Professor, eu assisti uma entrevista em que o senhor falou, pegando um gancho ali que a Cláudia Costinha deixou no bloco anterior, o senhor falava sobre educação e o impacto dessa ruptura tecnológica que a gente deve ter aí nos próximos 20 é, anos, como isso vai mudar absolutamente toda a forma como nós... É, estamos sendo educados, talvez torne tudo que a gente aprendeu até agora é, inútil. É, o senhor disse nessa entrevista que eu assisti que o fato de não haver um debate político sobre esse problema é o que mais preocupa o senhor. O senhor vê algum sinal é, de mudança nesse sentido? E mais, o que é que poderia dar um alerta para que as pessoas de fato passassem a pensar o futuro de uma maneira digamos, mm. eh, responsável. Yeah, there is change. I mean, both the political systems, at least in some countries, and also the public, is becoming more and more aware of the potential impact of the new technologies and discussion of the ownership of data, discussion of what's happening with the social media, discussions about the automation revolution. They are becoming, uh, they are entering the political arena. Maybe not enough. Uh, because the time we have to deal with these issues is very short, uh, but there are positive signs that people are noticing that this is very important and this should be a major issue in the political debates. A roda está aberta. Professor, é, a gente vive aqui no Brasil uma nuvem de pessimismo já há alguns anos, assim, tudo que pode piorar, de fato piora, mas essa nuvem é meio compartilhada aí no Ocidente. Estados Unidos, Europa, é muito normal. Quanto mais informado você é, mais pessimista. Mas na Ásia, por enquanto, essa situação é bem diferente. Eu morei três anos na China e até o menor vilarejo chinês, as pessoas de fato acreditam que a China está na sua melhor direção, no seu melhor momento. O senhor acha que a Ásia e outras regiões emergentes vão ficar blindadas desse pessimismo ou o senhor vê esse mesmo mal-estar com tecnologia, com o futuro do emprego, chegando na Ásia? Uh, I think that the division, say, between Asia and the West is not the right divisions. There are countries in both areas which will benefit from the coming technological revolutions, and there are countries in both areas which will lose a lot. So I, so I think that the division like Asia, the, the West, or Asia, America is, is, is the less relevant. Um, also about you know, optimism and pessimism, very often the images that people have in their minds are very different from the reality. They are not necessarily influenced or shaped only by objective conditions. They are also shaped by expectations. Now, what we have been seeing throughout history, and especially in the last few generations, is that the objective conditions of most humans have improved dramatically. Even in countries like Brazil, if you think about the last 30 years or 50 years, there are so many problems, but yet, from an objective perspective, there has been great progress over the last few decades. Nevertheless, people's, the feeling of people, how satisfied they are, doesn't depend on the objective conditions. It depends on their expectations. And we have seen it throughout history that when conditions improve, expectations increase. And therefore, very often, even when conditions improve, 
people become more dissatisfied. Como no Chile, por exemplo. Because the, 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 the gap between the rise in condition and the rise in expectations is, is becoming bigger. And very often it happens that after a period of, you know, you have a period of growth, and then people have lots and lots of more and more expectations, and no growth is forever. Not in Brazil, not in Japan, not in China. And then when you hit a break, the gap, I mean, your expectations continue to inflate, but the conditions no longer improve, or no longer improve so fast, and then there is a crisis. And if you look also at China, um, China has had a very good period economically since the late 1970s. For 40 years, the Chinese model have worked very well economically, but it never had to deal with a serious crisis. The big question mark over the Chinese model is how will it deal with a major crisis? If you look at the American model, so the great advantage of the American model, even today, compared with China, is that the American model is much older and it has managed to survive and overcome and improve itself through several cycles of crisis and regeneration. With the Chinese model, we don't have yet an actual example of how it deals with a major crisis, and crisis is, is, is inevitable. It's, it can't be that it will just be for decades and decades go going on without any crisis. And uh, we'll wait and see. Of course, it will have repercussions all over the world if China hits an economic crisis or an ecological crisis and, it's, it slows, and, and it slows down the economy further and there is political turmoil, it will have repercussions all over the world. It's one of the big questions, question marks over the, the global system. Um, even more generally, I, I would say, that the last big economic and financial crisis the world had was in 2008. And despite all the difficulties in 2008, the major powers of the world worked together effectively to prevent the worst outcome. If, the two th if a crisis like the 2008 crisis erupts tomorrow, and it can erupt tomorrow, any day now, any, maybe right now, maybe our phones are on silent, but maybe your phone is now full of messages <laughs> that this bank has collapsed and that bank, maybe. And if it happens now, there is no global cooperation, like in 2008. If we have the same kind of crisis like in 2008, we might be seeing a complete financial meltdown because there, we lack the necessary global trust and cooperation that we had in 2008 to deal with it. Professor Harari, uh, construindo em cima do que o meu colega de bancada colocou, uh, o futuro aparece em todos os seus livros como potencialmente trágico. E eu fico pensando nas políticas uhum. públicas que poderiam enfrentar uh, essa questão. O senhor falou há pouco da possibilidade de concertação global para resolver os problemas. Mas políticas públicas nacionais podem ser também relevantes e, infelizmente, nas eleições, nas recentes eleições mundiais, o Brasil, infelizmente, não é exceção, nós não discutimos o suficiente políticas públicas discutimos defeitos de adversários. Que políticas públicas poderiam ser importantes para evitar um futuro trágico? Hmm. Well, again, it depends on the country we are talking about, but uh, there are three main issues. I mean, the first issue is to regulate the most dangerous technologies. And this ranges from the development of new kinds of weapons, like autonomic, autonomous weapon systems, killer robots, that some countries around the world are, are developing, to uh, regulating surveillance systems to prevent the creation of uh, digital dictatorships that follow everybody all the time. And this is a danger in every country. I mean, even countries that lack a sophisticated high-tech sector of their own 
every government in the world today faces the temptation of buying sophisticated surveillance technology from the major players like China and the USA and creating a surveillance regime to monitor the citizens. And we can see in the next 10 or 20 years the rise of such digital dictatorships, dictatorships based on digital surveillance technology that follow everybody all the time. We can see this happening not just in the most developed countries, but even in some of the most backward, backward countries around the world. In Africa, in the Middle East, we can see the creation of these digital dictatorships. So we need to regulate to prevent that. And so one issue is regulation, which every country should do about itself. The second issue is education, what we talked about earlier. And the third issue is global trust and cooperation, because to deal with the most important issues, most countries will not be able to do it by themselves. Most countries, they don't have the resources and they are too vulnerable to outside influences. For if you think about the automation revolution, so uh, let's say that your country, you live in a country where many people still make a living from cheap manual labor. They are textile workers and, and things like that. Now the government can have rules, laws that protect the jobs in the textile industry from automation. But this will not be helpful at all if automation means that it's now cheaper to produce textile in the United States or in Germany than it is in Honduras or in Bangladesh. So if technology re will reach a point when it's cheaper to produce my shirt in California than in Honduras, there is nothing the Honduran government can do about it. Uh, but to save the economy from collapsing, and this will have, if, if it collapses, it has repercussions for the entire regions, then we need to build this global safety net. That to some of the enormous profits, I mean, automation will result in enormous profits, but we need to prevent these profits from being concentrated in only a few countries. We need a mechanism that the enormous profits in California somehow are used to protect and to better the situation of also people in Honduras. And for that, we need global cooperation. And uh, at present, we are, of course, running in the opposite direction. I don't see the current US administration raising taxes on US corporations in order to support unemployed people in mm. Central America. Professor. Um, Gostaria de retomar um ponto da sua resposta, a última resposta, é, sobre ditaduras digitais. É, as redes sociais também aproximaram minorias é, no Brasil muito, é, é, que conseguiram se conectar de alguma forma através é, das, das redes e dos grupos. É, ao mesmo tempo, é, tem um artigo seu publicado no Guardian, é, dia 22 de junho, é, por ocasião dos 50 anos do Stonewall, em que você faz um alerta muito... Me, me, me impressionei muito com, com esse texto sobre o aumento da homofobia e a relação entre é, esses grupos de ódio e as redes sociais também. Quer dizer, esses mesmos grupos que se beneficiaram é, das redes, de alguma forma, estão um pouco ameaçados é, pelas redes. É, deveria haver, então, uma diminuição do uso das redes sociais, um cuidado maior por esses grupos que estão é, sofrendo hum. violência crescente? Não, não. Eu mean, like every technology, it has a good side and a bad side. Social networks have been very positive in connecting, for example, gay people together, or connecting all kinds of groups together, and, and we, should, we shouldn't stop that. Uh, we should take action against the spread of hatred and hate, hate speech and harassment in the social networks, but we should, we should keep the social network functioning, of course. The big problem of digital dictatorships doesn't come from the social network or from the people using it, but from the government or from maybe some very powerful corporation 
which are collecting data on the people who are using the social network and then using it to monitor and control people. Again, if you take the LGBT community, so it's now uh, potentially much easier for a homophobic regime to find out, to discover all the gay people in the country much faster and uh, uh, more easily than ever before. Just by monitoring, not, not only the communications that people have, but even unconscious reactions that people have. You could be talking about, I don't know, a 15 years old teenager. Maybe I still don't know that I'm gay. Maybe I'm not sure yet. But the algorithm in the computer already knows that I'm gay because it is monitoring every, all my activities. Like even I, I, I surf YouTube. So maybe I don't watch any gay movies and I don't look at anything like that. But simply by uh, monitoring how my eyes react to different images of people, the algorithm and the government or corporation behind the algorithm already know that I'm gay. Let's say I'm, I'm surfing YouTube and I'm seeing uh, a video of uh, uh, a guy and a girl in, the, in, in, in swimming suits walking on the beach. Now, the computer can tell where my eyes focus. If my eyes focus more on the guy rather than the girl, and, and it happens repeatedly, so the algorithm already knows, oh, he's gay. And this can be used by corporations to sell me stuff. For instance, the corporation that wants to sell me anything, and it has two versions of a commercial, one with a, with a shirtless guy and one with the girl in a bikini, it knows to show me the advertisement with the shirtless guy. And maybe I still don't know, maybe I'm still not sure that I'm gay, but they already know it and use it against me. And that's relatively benign. But uh, if, for example, if you think about a country like Iran, which has the death penalty for homosexuality, so the Iranian police or the Iranian government could catch uh, gay teenagers just by these kind of, of monitoring systems with terrible consequences. So we are reaching a point when the combination of information technology and biotechnology, biotechnology is important to understand what's happening in your brain, in your body. When you combine the two, you get the technology to monitor everybody all the time, which was never possible before. If you think about the dictatorships of the 20th century, so if you live in the USSR in the time of Stalin, so the secret police cannot follow everybody all the time. It's just impossible. But in 10 years, some people in the world, billions of people, might be living in a digital dictatorship when not just everything they do, but even everything they feel is constantly monitored. Just think about, I don't know, North Korea in 10 years, when everybody has to wear a biometric bracelet which monitors your blood pressure, your heartbeat, your level of adrenaline in the blood, things like that. And you watch on television, at your home, or maybe in school, a speech by the big leader, and they monitor your blood pressure and your brain activity. And if you start seeing, if they start seeing signs of anger, they know, maybe I'm clapping and I'm, I'm forcing myself to smile, <laughs> but they know, no, 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 <laughs> he's angry. And tomorrow morning, I mean, some gulag or something. That would have been utterly impossible in Stalin's USSR, but it is becoming possible with the new technology of the 21st century. Nossa Senhora. Paulo e depois a Célia. Célia, por favor. Obrigada, Paulo. Ah. Não, é só para pegar um gancho, é, sendo que o senhor estuda exatamente essa questão da vigilância, do avanço da tecnologia, como é a sua relação com a tecnologia no dia a dia? Suas contas de mídias são alimentadas profissionalmente. Parece que o senhor não tem um celular, é isso? Então, é, é assim, é desconfiança. Como é que o senhor lida com a tecnologia? Na sua vida, né? Ah, I, I think that with every technology, you need to make sure that you are using it instead of being used by it. 
I don't avoid the new technology. It can be very helpful. And I use social media and, and so forth. But I try to be very mindful and use technology for my purposes without being controlled and enslaved by it. Uh, with smartphone, it's, it's a bit more tricky. I don't have a smartphone, but my husband carries a smartphone. So I'm actually burdening him with all the difficulties <laughs> of, of the smartphone. So, you know, it's, 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 it's the new status symbol. If you are really, really important, the new status symbol is that you don't have a smartphone. <laughs> if you have a smartphone, it means you have a boss. Somebody that controls you, that can access you all the time, that can tell you what to do. In many jobs today, you can't refuse. I mean, if you want the job, you have not just to have a smartphone. You need to have it on so that the boss can reach you in all kinds of crazy hours. So, you know, this is becoming the new normal. I remember my, my parents when they, uh, like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they came back home from work. That's it. No more work. There is no way the boss can reach them. But uh, I look at my, many of my friends and family members today. It can be on you know, Friday night, and suddenly they have a, an urgent message from the boss. You have to do this. You have to do that. Um, Dr. Paulo, eu vou só fazer um alerta que nós temos quatro minutos antes de é, fazer o próximo intervalo. Então, vou procurar ser inteligente e curto, que é difícil. <risos> é... Vamos voltar ao assunto bomba atômica, guerra nuclear versus açúcar. Bom, se houvesse Instagram, possivelmente não teríamos Nagasaki. A visão de uma cidade de Hiroshima destruída seria impeditiva do lançamento da guerra nuclear. Então, aí foi o lado bom. Mas o açúcar, né? a mesma campanha que faz com que a gente coma errado, né? é, melhor saúde coronariana é de... Tsunamis, caçadores, coletores da Bolívia, que andam, não comem açúcar, comida processada, é, e também tem algumas, algumas tênias que roubam a gordura dele. A mesma tecnologia, no caso, ela pode ser usada para regular estados, mas não empresas e consumos, empresas globais. Existiria, então, a necessidade de um código de ética para a empresa? Nós não temos uma ONU das empresas. Haveria, então, ter uma regulação ética dessas empresas? Yeah, we certainly need regulations for the companies, but, um, again, it, it, it always comes also back to the public and the government. I, I think that companies should be responsible and should be held responsible, but we shouldn't see them as the ultimate source of responsibility. The ultimate source of responsibility should remain the government, which in turn is answerable to the public, to the citizens. So yes, companies should think hard about what they are doing and how they earn their money, and they should stop uh, harmful practices. But ultimately, it's the job of the government to make sure that the companies are, 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 uh, are not harming us. And maybe the worst things that companies do is not this particular practice or that particular system, the worst thing they do is that they try to subvert the political system itself. Yes. Companies that don't want to be regulated, like, I don't know, I, I'm not sure about that, but just a hypothetical example. Like if you are the owner of some big food company, which makes a lot of money from selling sugar drinks and processed food maybe to schools, you don't want to be regulated. You don't want the government passing a law or the parliament passing a law that at least in schools, people should get, students should get healthy food and they shouldn't sell sugary drinks in school or something like that. So you, part of your profits go to paying politicians contributions for their election funds and whatever, and then, to make, and then you demand in return that they don't pass such laws and regulations. This is the worst practice that many com companies around the world have. And this is the first responsibility of the companies to stop doing that. O Roda Viva faz mais um rapidíssimo intervalo e volta com mais conversa com o professor, o escritor Yuval Noah Harari. Um segundinho, fica com a gente.
Roda Viva está de volta, terceiro bloco da entrevista com o escritor, professor Yuval Noah Harari, direto com o Raul Gislores. Professor, aproveitando a pergunta da Fernanda sobre homofobia no mundo, queria perguntar para o senhor se a, a relação entre as religiões monoteístas e não só homossexualidade, mas também a emancipação feminina, ela vai mudar porque as religiões parecem ainda algumas décadas muito atrasadas em relação à aceitação e mesmo respeito, não só as minorias como as mulheres. Uhum. Well, I think that um, religions are not made in heaven; they are made on earth by humans. And uh, I don't think that any religion has any kind of eternal essence. Uh, religions is what people make of them. Christianity is anything Christians make of it. Judaism is whatever Jewish, Jews made of, make of it. Uh, you can make of it a very tolerant and accepting religion, and you can make of it a very intolerant and homophobic and chauvinistic religion. It's up to you. It's not like in the text, in the book. The text contains so many things. Uh, unfortunately, in many cases throughout history, we see that uh, people used religion and used God to justify their worst tendencies. And where they say, I hate, no, God hates. I'm just following God's commands. And you're justifying your own hatred. Now, I don't think that if there is a God, that God would punish people for love. If you think about homophobia, for example, why would a loving God punish people just for loving each other? It seems totally unreasonable to me. So uh, as far as I can tell, the source of homophobia is not in God, is not in Christianity. It's in some Christians who justify their own hatreds and their own uh, mental weaknesses uh, in the name of God. And we've seen how religions change through history. That some religions, for example, supported slavery. And then at some point, uh, the same religions became uh, one of the main uh, fighters, warriors against slavery. And uh, it can happen in, in, in many other things too. So I think that we shouldn't fall into this uh, trap of believing that there is something deep inherent in a particular religion that makes it inevitably homophobic or inevitably against women or against this or against that. Fernanda Diamante, depois eu passo a palavra para a Cláudia Costin. Eu vou mudar um pouco o assunto. É, eu queria falar um pouco sobre a sua, uh, o sua trabalho de escrever os seus livros. Seus livros são muito, são extremamente é, comunicativos e eles é, comunicam ideias bastante complexas e tem é, a, a narrativa deles tem muito de ficção no sentido do ritmo da escolha dos caminhos e eu queria então saber se a, a, a literatura de ficção é, em especial a ficção científica de autores como Orwell, Huxley é, e o Asimov uhum. é, influenciaram influenciam a sua, <risos> o seu trabalho é, de yeah, escrita very much so I mean I think that my job uh, is to kind of build a bridge between the scientific community and the general public. Um, many scientists are just engaged with their own deep research in various fields from evolution or genetics or climate science or AI. And they write only for a small circle of other scientists. And we need people that will communicate the latest findings and theories of the scientific community to the general public, to serve as, as this kind of bridge. And to do that, you have to write and you have to talk in a way which will be not only easily accessible, but also interesting and captivating for the general audience. So you need to know science, of course, otherwise you're just conveying nonsense. But at the same time, you need also to master the techniques of literature or, uh, in order to, to know how to reach the public. And science fiction is one of the genres that can teach us how to do it. And I think maybe today it's the most important uh, autistic genre in the world 
because most people, what they know about AI comes far more from science fiction than from science. And again, you can do it well or you can do it badly. I mean, science fiction can convey accurate ideas and theories, or it can mislead the public by focusing on the wrong issues. I'm afraid that in many cases, science fiction is not doing the best job. It, for example, focuses the attention of the public on completely unrealistic scenarios, like the most favorite scenario of science fiction books and movies dealing with AI is that the robots and computers suddenly gain consciousness and then rebel against the humans and you have like a Terminator-like scenario, that the war between the robots and the humans. This is extremely unlikely to happen in the next few decades. There is no indication that robots or computers are anywhere on the road to gaining consciousness and rebelling against us. Uh, the real dangers of advances in AI are things like robots and computers pushing people out of the job market or a uh, new technology empowering a government or a small elite to build a digital dictatorship. The robots are not evil, they don't rebel, they do exactly what the government tells them to do, but the government is evil and the government is telling them to spy on everybody and to control everybody, and the problem is that the robots never rebel. And this is a far more scary and realistic scenario than most of the scenarios that science fiction is dealing with them. Claudia. Uh, Professor Harari, uh, a OCDE vem dizendo que nós precisamos desenvolver na população a capacidade de resolver colaborativamente problemas com criatividade. O senhor falou há pouco que uh, há muito que ser feito pelos governos e pelos cidadãos, uh, e não tanto pelas empresas, exatamente. Uh, o que, que cabe aos cidadãos, de forma organizada, fazer para lidar com esse cenário possível, uh, como eu disse há pouco, trágico, uh, e resolver problemas que vão aparecendo nos seus países e no mundo? Well, first, the citizens need to inform themselves about <coughs> the new technological developments and the potential impact on fields like economy or politics. Now, it's not that everybody needs a PhD in computer science. They don't. They just need to have a basic understanding of what is the potential of AI. I also, I don't have a PhD in, in computer science. I don't know how to code computers. I only know if the computer is, is malfunctioning, close it down and start again. <laughs> That's basically the, the only thing start I know. Break. But to understand what AI might do to economics or to politics, you don't need a PhD. So that's the first thing to educate yourself about. And you know, it's important for everybody. Some people say, no, I'm, I'm too poor. I have other issues. That's, that's not my priority but it's going to have an impact on everybody and actually on the poor even more than on the rich. If you don't educate yourself and you just allow other people to make decisions for you, it doesn't mean you'll not be affected. It just means you have no control over the future of yourself and, and your children. Um, but of course, just educating yourself is not enough. <laughs> Then you need to uh, organize yourself with other people to make a political change. Now, I don't think that individual action can do that. Uh, there are lots of people who, you know, like they, they, they just write posts or something and on Facebook, and it's important to some extent. But ultimately, politics is always about organization. 50 people who are members of an organization that cooperates are far more powerful than 500 people who was just individuals doing, each one is doing something separately. So you, we need to, to, to cooperate and uh, we need to change the, really the public conversation. And this is part of, of my job that I'm like coming now into Brazil or to different countries. First of all, just change the conversation, change the questions that people ask politicians and that politicians ask themselves. Like you look at the world in, over the last few years, so you see enormous interest in issues like um, um, immigration. Mm. 
of like terrorism. And far less interest in questions relating to the rise of artificial intelligence. Even though AI is far more dangerous to the future of humanity than terrorism. So we need to change the conversation. Yes, we still need to deal with terrorism. It's still a problem. But comparatively, we should have far more attention focused on the rise of AI and what it will do to the economy and to the political system. Dr. Paulo. Professor, uh, we are talking about... What we? Desculpe. <laughs> é, é, professor, é, nós estamos falando uh, sobre bilhões, mas eu tenho um viés do indivíduo. Eu é, consigo imaginar de que o meu maior terror não é perder o um emprego pela, pelo robô, é perder o sentido de viver. Sim, o sentido da minha identidade no mundo onde a informação do que eu vou fazer é ditada por uma média de bilhões e que não seja necessariamente a minha. E, paradoxalmente, existe uma associação entre o aumento das uhum. da inteligência artificial e, uh, e a ausência de problemas objetivos com o aumento da taxa de suicídios. Por exemplo, bom, o seu, Israel, por exemplo, Israel, ele não é cercado por amigos por, por vizinhos amigáveis, mas a taxa de suicídio em Israel vem caindo, ao contrário do que vem acontecendo no resto é, do mundo. E os países com menor taxa de suicídio uhum. são os que são menos beneficiados por essas maravilhas tecnológicas. O senhor acha que vai ter espaço para o humano nesse mundo de bilhões de informações para um indivíduo se sentir parte de um todo? É, yeah, that's maybe the most complicated question, even more than the economic or political issues, is what will happen to the meaning of life of individuals. Mm -hmm. Because we are used to thinking about human life as a drama of decision-making. Life is like a, a road, and every now and then you reach a junction, and you need to decide. And, you know, so much of art focuses on that. Almost every... Shakespeare play or every Hollywood comedy focuses on the hero or heroine needing to make a very important decision, to be or not to be, to marry Mr. X or to marry Mr. Y. And that's the entire narrative revolves around that. And similarly in religion, so also religions uh, depict human life as a big drama of decision making that eternal salvation or damnation depends on making the right decision, the right choice. What happens to human life when more and more decisions are taken for us by the algorithm? Uh, what, what to study in university, where to work, whom to marry, I'm not deciding that. An algorithm is telling this to me because the algorithm knows better. Similarly, if I apply for a job, it's not a human being that decides whether to give me the job, it's an algorithm. And we don't have really models for understanding a human life in which most decisions are taken for you by an algorithm, by a computer, that knows you better than you know yourself. I would almost say that we are facing a kind of philosophical and spiritual bankruptcy because all the philosophical and religious models and spiritual models we have from the past, they tell us that decision-making, this is the big thing in human life. And they can't really conceive of a human life in which most decisions are taken for us by an algorithm. And uh, I think this is not the responsibility of government. This is the responsibility of philosophers and poets and artists and individual people to explore that. What does it mean to live in, in such a situation? And we need a kind of almost philosophical revolution or spiritual revolution to deal with this kind of unprecedented development. O terceiro bloco do Roda Viva voou. Nós voltamos já já com o quarto e último bloco. Bom, não preciso nem dizer para você não sair daí. Acho que não dá para sair daí. É um segundinho só. E o Valno Harari 
Roda Viva. Nós estamos de volta, último bloco da entrevista com o professor, escritor Yuval Noah Harari. É, professor, como o senhor sabe, aqui no Brasil, assim como em outros países, a gente vive um momento em que uma parte da sociedade está operando na lógica da anticiência. Essa expressão foi, inclusive, usada aqui no Roda Viva por um dos maiores cientistas do Brasil, o climatologista Carlos Nobre. Há uma espécie de sensação de que uh, professores, acadêmicos, pesquisadores estão ali sob ataque. Essa é a sensação que a academia libera, emana aí para o país hoje. Aproveitando um pouco do que o senhor falou para a Fernanda, sobre a necessidade de os cientistas falarem, falarem numa linguagem acessível, o que é que o senhor diria para as pessoas que estão aqui no Brasil fazendo, travando a batalha da informação, da informação de qualidade, da ciência. But you need to continue fighting this battle that uh, it's been going on throughout human history. It's not something new. Uh, throughout human history, people um, spread not just the truth, but also a lot of fiction and a lot of propaganda. It's nothing new what's happening now. Uh, the situation now is actually much better than it was in throughout history. At least in some fields, people trust the experts and not all kinds of charlatans or people that, that, that spread lies. If you think about the medical field, for example, for much of history, medicine was the field of expertise of priests and rabbis and shamans and, and things like that. And this was actually maybe the, one of the most important functions of religion was medicine. Many religious leaders, if you think even about Jesus, most of what they do is cure people. And this is no longer the case. The responsibility for medicine has shifted in most of the world from religious leaders to doctors. And even the religious people, when they are sick, they go to the doctor. They don't go to the priest. Maybe the doctor says there is nothing to do. Then they say, okay, let's pray. I mean, there is nothing else to do, let's pray. It, it, it can't harm. But uh, in many fields, also in agriculture, say a thousand years ago, there was a drought. So what do you do? You go to the priest and you pray. What do you do now when there is a drought? You don't go to the priest, you go to the engineer. Okay, l l let's desalinize seawater. Let's build a dam over a river and divert water. All kinds of solutions. But the solutions don't come from praying. They come from science, they come from technology. And we have seen this shift in more and more fields. Um, and we need <coughs> to continue working in this direction. Again, I don't think that there is a necessary clash between religion and science in this field. Religion can be very helpful. If you think, for example, about uh, the climate crisis, so we have seen the current Pope making some very helpful statements and trying to enact a good policy, uh, giving motivation to people to prevent the, uh, the further deterioration of the climate crisis. So it's not, I don't think we should frame it as a kind of battle between science and religion. Ideally, it should be a cooperation when science provides us with the fact the facts of the matter, this is the responsibility of scientists to tell us what is happening. And then when it comes to deciding what to do, here we need to gain inspiration from good values. Uh, and here is, this is some, some, somewhere where religion can be very helpful. Celia. Uh, professor, sobre mudança climática. É um assunto em que as evidências já estão, assim, bastante próximas, visíveis na vida das pessoas e já tem até um, uma certa construção política, institucional em relação a isso. Agora, qual é a sua opinião em relação a, por exemplo, o Acordo de Paris ou as metas, do, os objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável? As respostas, elas estão vindo no ritmo em que elas deveriam vir? 
Uh, at present, we are seeing actually a, a regression, a reverse. Instead of seeing progress uh, in many places around the world, again, global cooperation on this is breaking apart, is, is falling apart. Uh, at least in some countries, there is growing distrust and disbelief that the ecological crisis is real. And this is extremely dangerous. And it, I think we need to separate two issues which very often people confuse. There is the issue of whether the climate crisis is real, and there is the issue of what to do about it. Now, the issue of whether the climate crisis is real, that's a purely scientific issue. It's not a matter for politicians or even for voters to say if it's real or not. It's a scientific question. It's like, I don't know, let's say that I have some disease, so I don't go around my family members, let's have a vote what kind of disease I have. No, I go to the expert. And if the expert tells me, hey, you have cancer, then I should believe the expert. I can ask another, another expert, of, of course. But ultimately, it's the responsibility of the scientific experts to tell us what is happening, what is the problem. They've done that job. Now it's the time for politicians and voters to decide what to do, because there are always different things to do. With cancer, you can decide to have chemo, or you can decide to have uh, 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 this treatment or that, tre or no treatment. You say, okay, I, I just want to have another last two, two good years of life, and that's it. And it's up to me and my family to decide what to do, not up to the experts. That just give me advice. It's the same with, with climate change. Once we realize it's real, it's happening, then we have different policies how to deal with it. What should be the responsibility of different countries, the rich countries, the poor countries? Uh, how fast we should do it? Whether we should have a carbon tax? There are many different options. And here, we need a political process. And if people say, if, if most people would vote, let's do nothing, then that's the vote of the people. I think it's a bad idea, but in a democracy, if most people, they know the reality, they know the consequences, and they still say, okay, even though we know, we prefer not to do anything now, to have a good life now, and in 50 years our children will suffer the consequences. If most people vote for it, that's a democracy. What can you do? It's not the responsibility of, of the scientists to uh, establish a scientific dictatorship and tell people, no, you make the wrong decision. No, I hope that people won't decide on that. But we should always remember there is a division of labor between the scientists and the voters. The scientists tell us what is the situation, and the voters should believe that. They are the experts on that. And then, when you have the different options what to do, this is the job of the voters to decide what they want, what do they desire. How? Prof Professor, I wanted to talk about the remedies this onda global de depressão, ansiedade e suicídios. O senhor podia contar um pouquinho sobre a sua experiência com a meditação, o que mudou na sua vida, e se o senhor acha que drogas hoje legais, hum. como a maconha é nos Estados Unidos, vão ser cada vez mais aceitas por sociedades que proibiam até a pouco. Ou seja, não só a maconha, mas um exemplo, porque nos Estados Unidos, né, cada referendo que, que aparece, ela acaba sendo aprovada. Well, about drugs, I'm not an expert, uh, so I'm not sure what the both medical and psychological uh, results of various drugs are. Uh, so I, I don't like to venture my opinion. I think we should ask the experts and we should make, again, a political decision in the end, whether to legalize certain drugs or not, according to the facts about the impact of these various drugs not because of some pre, pre, uh, uh, preconditioned thought, not because of some religious taboos, but according to the scientific facts, maybe it turns out that marijuana is actually far better for you than alcohol. So why do we have a ban on alcohol? And we, uh, so why, why we allow alcohol and we have a ban on marijuana? It doesn't make sense. So again, I'm not saying let's ban alcohol, and I'm just saying that we should ask the experts, gather the evidence, and make the decision on the basis of that and not on the basis of some preconceptions. Um, you ask about meditation, so I'll answer more, more generally. That especially today, 
it's very important to get to know yourself better uh, because you now have all these corporations and governments that are trying to hack you, to monitor, to get you know you better and exploit your own mental weaknesses against you. Now, get to know yourself is a very old advice. It's what spiritual leaders throughout history told people. This is what Buddha and Jesus and Socrates told people thousands of years ago, get to know yourself better. But previously, you didn't have competition. If you neglected to make the effort to understand your own mind, nobody outside you could look inside you. So the urgency was less. Now it's very urgent. You have all these corporations and governments getting inside your head, understanding you better than you understand yourself, and you need to stay ahead of them. You need to know yourself, and especially know your own mental weaknesses, better than the government or Facebook or Amazon knows you. And this can be done in various ways. Some people go to therapy, some people do sports, they go hiking in the mountains, some people do meditation, I do meditation. I do Vipassana meditation, I meditate every day for two hours, I go every year for a long retreat of 30 days or 60 days to really get to know myself better, understand my mind, understand my own weaknesses, understand the deep sources of my misery, of my decisions in life. And I think it's now more important than ever before for people to take up some such practice. Again, whatever works for you. If it's not meditation, if it's sports, then invest in it. But remember, it's the one thing you cannot outsource to somebody else. If you're, say, the uh, CEO of a multi-billion dollar company, and you're so busy, like every hour of yours is worth a billion dollars, and you give everything to somebody else to do for you, this is something you can't give for somebody else to do for you. The only person that can really explore your own mind for you is yourself. So I would encourage everybody from you know, the, the, the uh, poorest person to the richest person, in the 21st century, you need to get to know yourself better. É, nós temos três minutos para encerrar o programa, então eu vou fazer uma proposta. É, Cláudia e Fernanda fazem a pergunta e o professor responde de uma vez só. Pode ser, professor? I'll do it short. Ok, obrigada. <risos> Bom, uh, professor, o senhor é um historiador uh, e há um certo descrédito hoje em alguns governos ou em algumas uh, correntes de pensamento em relação às ciências humanas. Uh, eu gostaria que o senhor falasse um pouco sobre a experiência de ser historiador e sobre a urgência de se pensar historicamente hoje. Perfeito. Fernanda? Eu queria, na verdade, completar a última pergunta. É, queria saber se você... É, dois dos seus livros favoritos de ficção e de, de ficção científica e é, é, saber por que, que as pessoas é, são tão apaixonadas por você no Vale do Silício que é justamente um dos pontos centrais <risos> da sua crítica. Oh. E será que eles entendem o que você <risos> fala? Uh, well, I'll try to answer briefly. I think uh, they are interested because they understand they have enormous power in their hands and uh, they are not sure what to do with it. And they are realizing they have made some problematic decisions. And, you know, most of them are engineers. They have no background or, or mathematicians. They don't have a deep background in history, in philosophy, in social sciences. And this also goes to, to, to your question. And our problem now is not the technology. It's the humans. Technology gives us immense power, but it's still up to us to decide what to do with it. And this is the job of the social sciences and the humanities. Based, I and mean, I think that today philosophers are more important than any previous time in history because many philosophical questions that for thousands of years were just theoretical questions, they are now becoming practical questions. Questions about the meaning of life, questions about free will, whether it exists or not, uh, they are now very practical questions. So the people in Silicon Valley, they realize they need the philosophers and the historians. And I think also the people in the humanities and social sciences, 
they should realize they have an enormous responsibility now. And to fulfill that responsibility, they need to understand the technology better. Philosophers shouldn't be afraid of AI or of genetics. They should engage with it more. Now about science fiction, so uh, maybe my favorite book is Brave New World by Aldo Saxley, which is still, I think, the most prophetic book of the 20th century. Uh, instead of another book, I'll recommend a TV series. I think that Black Mirror uh, is maybe the best uh, science fiction uh, TV show of, of, of the last year. I mean, some, cha some, some uh, 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 chapters are better, some worse, but overall it's very imaginative and, and fresh and very responsible. Uh, they explore, at least in some uh, of the, of the uh, uh, chapters, uh, very realistic uh, scenarios. So uh, I would end by saying that I think it's now extremely important for the humanities and the natural sciences and computer sciences to work together uh, because only by working together we can take responsible decisions about what to do with AI and bioengineering. Nós estamos, infelizmente, chegando ao final desta edição do Roda Viva. Eu agradeço muitíssimo a participação da Célia Rosenblum, do Raul Justilores, da, do Paulo Saldiva, da Cláudia Costin e da Fernanda Diamante, além do nosso cartunista muso, Paulo Caruso. Eu agradeço também a você que nos acompanhou até agora e muito especialmente ao professor Yuval Harari. Foi realmente um prazer e Thank uma you very honra much. receber aqui o senhor no Roda Viva. Bom, então eu deixo a você aí um convite. Não esquece, na segunda-feira que vem nós temos de novo esse encontro marcado aqui no Roda Viva às 22 horas. Eu espero vocês. Até lá. <música>